Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everybody. And today we are going to discuss about a very interesting and intriguing case, which will going to cover a lot of aspects of bone physiology, renal physiology, acidosis, alkalosis, and this is going to be a very challenging case, both in terms of diagnosis and assessment. Normally, when we talk about diagnosis, it's usually more of a mathematical model, which we talk about in uh, pediatric endocrine practice, but often we have to go beyond that because there may be conflicting uh, reports which may come and then the diagnosis may be confusing. So I'll invite uh, Dr. Naveen, who will be talking about uh, this very, very interesting case of uh, a diagnostic dilemma, which a child came to us recently and we'll discuss about how we reach the diagnosis, how we can further enhance in terms of diagnosis and in terms of management. Before we start, we'll just, um, uh, this is uh, part of a PG lecture uh, grand round. So we actually have three grand rounds which are there. And you can go and have a look at our website where all the presentations are available in that regards. And you can go and have a look at our courses which are available, including the fellowship and the diploma courses. And this is part of our PG grand round. We also run a PG lecture series every month and a grand round for endocrinologists every month. Our publications are there and applications are there which you can have a look at it. So we have a very interesting case coming up. Dr. Naveen, uh, please come up and uh, explain about this case. Good afternoon, all. Uh, we'll be discussing an interesting case on uh, uh, refractory repairs as well as pathological fractures. Uh, we had this eight-year-old male child who was uh, uh, born out of a non-consanguinous marriage and he was fought by his birth order, came with a complaints of difficulty in walking. And uh, when we asked the uh, probe the further history, we found that he had this complaint uh, which was running for the past uh, two to three years. And uh, initially, uh, along with the uh, difficulty walking, he also had a bony deformity which predominantly involved the lower limbs and uh, there was an issue of bone pain. And for the same uh, complaint, the patient had been running to several doctors and, uh, on, on, and he has been on, uh, on a consistent orthopedician for the past two years for, and uh, he was treated with multiple <coughs> doses of vitamin D just given both in the form of uh, injection as well as oral treatment and also along with calcium supplement. And for the same, he was also uh, given some form of orthopedic in intervention in the form of cast. And following the treatment for a very long time, after one to two years, they, they found a mild improvement, which was, was in the form of the patient was able to start, it, start walking, but it was not as uh, no, like normal compared to the other sibling. He was not able to run as uh, run or walk as uh, normally as compared to the other people, other uh, children. And uh, however, in the pre, in the last four months before, he met with a when he was climbing down the stairs, he actually uh, fell down two steps above the ground and following which he had a very severe fracture involving the both upper, uh, involving the, both the lower limbs and for which the cast was applied. And despite all these treatment, he was able, he previously was at least able to walk. Now, despite, uh, after all these treatment for the past three months, now he's able to not walk as well as he is not able to even stand without support. Now you have this case who has a three-year-old child, very early onset lower limb deformities and looks like a fracture. Yes. So now based upon these three things, very early onset, lower limb we don't know, we haven't examined, so we don't know what yes. is the other way. So there is a definitely looks like a rickets yes, with sir. fracture. So yes, very sir. early onset rickets with fractures, what are the things you will think? Sir, he is actually eight years old and it started at around five years of age. Five years, yes, two, three years, sir, uh, two, three years before years. and uh, eight years. So what would you think of it in that regards? Sir, I would uh, probably uh, think of the fact that uh, it could be a, uh, a CKD because there's uh, uh, rickets, refractory rickets. Definitely it is a case of refractory rickets along with pathological factors. So one possibility involving the mainly the lower limbs, I would actually think of hypophosphatic rickets as a possibility, a chronic kidney disease or a uh, renal tubular acidosis. So how common, so now you have to look at, one is of course a refractory rickets. Yes, sir. In refractory rickets, we know chronic kidney disease number one, hypophosphatic rickets, RTA number two, proximal mm -hmm. RTA number three, and VDDR number four. But as soon as you start talking about fractures, will the hierarchy change? 
Yes, sir. In case if it is a fracture, definitely the possibility of hypophosphatic crickets coming will be lower down the order. At this stage, having a fracture with hypophosphatic crickets will be extremely unusual. So it will basically be excluded. Second, if we talk about chronic kidney disease, how often do you see CKD patients coming with fractures? Sir, it is also a very rare case, but the thing is that CKD is more common and it is also associated so with refractory cats. Long-standing severe CKD causing fractures may also cause many other things by that time the patient comes to you very severe anemia requiring blood transfusion, pulmonary edema, so that becomes less <laughs> likely from that perspective. Now, one condition, now with it, now you've got RTA as a major thing versus VDDR. What about VDDR? So VDDR usually very rarely presents with rickets and bony deformity. More often, it usually presents with symptoms of hypocalcemia, which is often encountered during the infantile period and within the early. It can present with bony deformity, but then the onset will be very early. You can't wait till 5-7 years to present that. So now if I talk about five causes of non allodemic uh, refractory rickets uh, in that sense, now the most likely possibility is renal tubular yes. Now, which of these presents more with fractures? Sir, more in case if it is fractured, it is distal RTA. So, at, this is a classical presentation if you ask me, an 8 to 10 year old child who will present with a relatively early onset feature but now has a fracture, so distal RTA will be more likely. There the bone is very much affected. Now, Dr. Manoj, when we compare bone involvement in distal and proximal RTA, what is the difference in pathophysiology? Sir, in the pro in proximal RTA, uh, there is a bone involvement due to the uh, loss of the minerals, mm -hmm. while in distal RTA, bone involvement due to the part of metabolic acidosis. So, if we talk about uh, rickets or metabolic bone disease, we say phosphorus deficiency is the fundamental cause of all these bone deformities because phosphorus causes the apoptosis of the fungus. So, you need to have phosphorus deficiency. In proximal RTA, the phosphorus deficiency is much more because you are losing phosphorus a lot. You, of course, have secondary hyperparathyroidism in distal RTA, which will cause phosphorus deficiency, but here the phosphorus deficiency is very less. What about calcium deficiency? So calcium deficiency occurs in both. So you will have hypercalciuria, you will lose. But you can't lose a very huge amount of calcium because when you say 4 mg per kg is the limit for hypercalciuria. So, 4 mg per kg in a 15 year kg child will be like 60 mg. So, it is not going to be the primary cause, but it's a contributing cause. The big difference is that there the phosphorus is very low, the acidosis is much more in distal RTA. So, distal RTA is purely an acidotic effect on the bone. Proximal RTA is largely an effect of phosphorus deficiency. Plus, then why is it more severe than hypophosphatic rickets? So, because of the fact that uh, it is the acidosis is more severe enough, and uh, you have some acidosis, you have secondary hyperparathyroidism. You don't have hyperparathyroidism in a hypophosphatemic. So that's why if you now hierarchically arranged hypophosphatemic rickets will be very very milder disease compared to proximal RTA, and then finally distal RTA will be the most significant. So if I now go back to this history of a Mid middle childhood onset with looks like lower limb with fractures, the most likely possibility will be RTA distal followed by proximal. This is based upon the finding that we found. Carry forward. And with regards to the other history, there was a history of a poor gain in height and weight since the onset of deformities. And uh, there was a history of polydipsia, however, this is not very severe. When we probed the history, they told that he was actually drinking more amount of water when compared to other children at home. And there was no polyuria, recurrent episodes of fever or uh, paralysis. And uh, there was no history of abdominal pain or hematuria, ruling out the possibility of nephrocalcinosis. There was no decreased urine output, headache, uh, breathlessness to rule out CKD with hypertension complications. No problems recurring any dental interventions to rule out the possibility of hypophosphatic rickets. And there was no tetanic convulsions or carpopid uh, to rule out the possibility of VDDR. And uh, no abdominal distension, chronic diarrhea or steatoria to rule out the possibility of malabsorption syndrome, most commonly being the celiac disease. And there was no night blindness, photophobia, and bleeding gums to rule out other uh, micronutrient deficiency, also to rule out the possibility of uh, low syndrome, dense syndrome, where there is loss of uh, low molecular weight uh, <coughs> proteins, which cause a loss of retinal 
uh, binding protein leading to vitamin A deficiency and transient night blindness. And there was no jaundice, hematomasis, or melina obturitis to rule out the possibility of cholestatic uh, jaundice and also chronic liver disease. And uh, there was no history of abnormal movements or any decline in studies to rule out the possibility of Wilson disease. That's what you said. There are no features of chronic liver disease. Now, how common is the refractory rickets in liver disease? Sir, it is very rare unless it is associated with malabsorption or tyrosine. Why? Uh, because uh, liver has a very large capacity of uh, vitamin D storage. So, it has to be around 90% of uh, liver, which is... 25 hydroxyl enzyme is much more than it is needed in the body. So, unless the liver goes off completely, when the patient will have hepatic encephalopathy, you will not develop rickets in that scenario. So, as you very nicely said, that if you have rickets in liver disease, most likely think of proximal RTA, which is also damaging the liver, rather than liver being a primary pillar. Now, you mentioned a very important point that there is no polyuria or paralysis. So, which weight form of RTA would this now point? Sir, no. Who has more polyuria? Proximal so, proximal has more polyuria. Okay. And uh, so why, why do they have polyuria? So, proximal, because of there, there is a loss of potassium hypokalemia, which can cause polyuria. Okay. Apart from more hypokalemia. Sir, distal as, but uh, in case of proximal, there is excessive uh, uh, fa the fraction excretion of sodium is also a very high. There is a loss of uh, sodium, which is being uh, delivered to the distal. Okay. So, now let's go one by one. So, what you are trying to say is that proximal RTA has got more polyuria yes, because of solute. Solid so loss. Using uh, phosphorus, you're using sodium, you're using other things. other things. But the major cause of polyuria in RT, one of course is tubular dysfunction, is also at the level of uh, a problem of ABP action, which is mainly because of hypokalemia. So that's why distal RT often may have more polyuria. What about paralysis? Who is more likely to have paralysis, distal or proximal? Because their potassium is much lower. So, these are pointers, but you can't use them as a criteria to distinguish, but they are subtle signs. So, at this level, you expect much severe hypokalemia, which is, if it's not there, will go more in favor of a proximal diet. But these are subtle signs. Yeah. And with regards to the uh, past history, there was no any significant past history prior to this uh, lower limb deformities. There was no any significant hospital admission for dehydration. There was no history of any blood transfusion and no chronic drug intake. And with regards to the breast uh, birth history, there was no any antenatal uh, polyadromnos. No, it, it, the, the baby was a normal child with a normal birth weight, and there was no significant neonatal admission. And uh, with regards to the family history, there was no history of any similar illness of bony deformity within the family, and there was no history of any uh, dialysis or kidney transplant uh, done in the family members, and there was no history of any polyuria, recurrent stones, or abnormal pain in mother. And with so uh, which drug history would you like to take? Sir, I would like to ask in case of a history of astrozolamide uh, okay. and uh, antiretroviral drugs in case uh, the patient has been affected. So in other words, what are the causes of proximal? Which drugs cause proximal RTA? Sir, proximal RTA, most commonly the uh, astrozolamide, tenofovir, uh, ifophosphamide, and. Uh, which common anti epileptic drug causes? Sir, valproate. Can topiram. 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 So you need to specifically ask that because others are very specific. If you talk about like phosphamide, they will be using very specific yes. scenarios. But topiramate is something you need to ask about. Ethylazolamide also in very rare scenario of raised ICT will be used in that department. So drug intake becomes important. Which toxins will cause that? Exposure to which toxins? The toxins lead, lithium. So heavy metal, mercury, lead, they will cause uh, the damage in that person. So you need to ask about that question. Okay, it and with regards to the development history, the child was studying in class 2, which was actually age appropriate at the two years before. But because of the COVID and also the bony deformities, he was not sent to school for the last two years. And he had uh, all these milestones, which was achieved appropriate for the age. And there was no regression of previously attained milestones. And with regards to the diet history, uh, it was appropriate for age and there was no calorie or protein deficit for noted. And now we have the summary of an eight year old male child who was born out of a non conservativeness marriage, not gaining in height and weight since two years. And he had bony deformities, which was partially improving with vitamin D treatment, which is most likely to be refractory touch. And he also had a fracture following a trivial trauma. 
and which was basically pathological. So, what is your impression now at this moment? Sir, as you already mentioned, the first thing would be a RTA, most likely to be a distal RTA followed by proximal RTA. And next uh, thing would be uh, kidney, think of a minor a tubular predominant kidney disease. Yes. Because if it's a glomerular kidney disease, usually they will have many more other manifestations. Some like obstructive neuropathy, like the child who comes to us who had now has got a glomerular function disease. So they will take time. They, they will typically present at this age with Similar picture, they'll behave like RTA. And uh, when we've, we've uh, based on the history, we got the examination done and uh, we found that most of these uh, examination findings are positive with relevant to the history. We had the features of uh, rickets in the form of widening of race, racketic rosary, protrubent abdomen. There was severe tenderness and pain on movement of the lower limb, and there was no alopecia. <clears throat> to rule out the vitamin D dependent rickets, no cataract which was ruled out to variety of disorders including galactosemia and uh, uh, so low syndrome. So genetic other than the normal one, but which are the syndromic causes? Other... So syndromic usually there are autoimmune conditions that are most commonly associated with distal RTA, which basically involves the uh, systemic lupus erythematosus and Jogren syndrome. And there was no dental abnormalities uh, in the form of enamel hypoplasia, which is commonly seen in uh, hypocalcemic uh, rickets, and also dental abscess to rule out the possibility of hypophosphatic rickets. There was no pallor ictress and clubbing to rule out uh, malabsorption as well as uh, chronic liver disease. No cafelate spot to rule out the possibility of mechanal bed syndrome. No hepatospinomegaly, uh, and also there was no hemangioma. And uh, this was the child who, as we could clearly see from the picture, the patient had clear features of uh, rickets along with a uh, severe failure to thrive. When we got the uh, vitals done, which was all normal, and there was no acidotic breathing, and uh, his uh, height was uh, severely deranged with a minus 3.40 standard deviation, and weight also was severely deranged. Now, if you look at the growth parameters, what do they tell you? So it looks to be a more of a nutritional pattern, but both are equally affected. So it excludes hypopositive rickets basically. Basically, right? yes, Because it is too low. Yes, sir. Can anything else now you will start thinking of something else as well, given the growth parameters? Sir, very rarely celiac disease being more common, but with this kind of presentation with celiac disease, uh, so lab, but still we have to. Definitely, if it was rickets alone, fractures are very unlikely. So pure vitamin deficiency should not cause rickets. So, Dr. Pratik, what are the pointers of refractory rickets right at diagnosis? One, of course, is the treatment has been given, the patient has not responded. What are the other pointers you would think of? That this rickets is not normal. Fracture. Fracture is number one. Severe book failure to fight is number two. Polyuria, polydipsia, these things will of course keep. Yeah, so I'm not talking about this. Yes. I'm talking about what are the pointers yes. of the fracture rickets right at diagnosis. Fracture is a very big pointer. What is the uh, causes of neonatal fractures? What is trauma? Yes, that is there. Metabolic bone disease, which you have premature check, that is the second common thing. Third, why? Then, hypophosphatasia. So, all those. So, fractures and BDDR. BDDR is always on differential diagnosis than a neonatal. But at this age group, if you talk about fractures other than trauma, uh, like I have seen patients who have been labeled quote unquote as osteoarthritis imperfecta, who have been then labeled as who turn out to be art. So, you need to be aware about that this level of height retardation will go against OI and other abnormalities. So, again, I summarize the case. Uh with uh, after the examination findings we had this eight-year-old male giant born out on non consanguineous marriage with a severe failure to thrive refractory catch and pathological fractures what's the hearing normal sir so this would be the probable dds i would like to rule out so and uh, first investigation which was uh, basically done and which was actually present along with the patient which showed a severe uh, generalized osteopenia along with classical features of rickets heel fractures and uh, probably loser zone. So, are yeah, these so the this is a very, very characteristic x-ray. What you see is that the bone is absolutely, the cortex is very, very thin. Just like a pencil thin cortex, you can say. So, it means there is a severe osteopenia. The bone is not being formed. 
at all. We talk about how at different stages the chondrocyte is not being formed. Then we talk about bone not being formed, bone not being mineralized. So bone is formed, but it is not mineralized. mineralized. So this is actually similar to what you see in hypophosphatasia, something like that. Hypophosphatasia, it is not getting deposited. Here you don't have any phosphorus, that's why it's not getting deposited. You are uh, seeing features of rickets, but often with nutritional rickets, you will see much worse features in the metaphysical. So the whole bone here is it's not just that the it's a disorder affecting just the metaphysis, epiphysis, that area. It is affecting the entire bone. When you see nutritional rickets, you will see much more cupping, fraying, which is not very much visible here. What is uh, what you are seeing are uh, fractures. Uh, we are not seeing, but loser zone are there. What are loser zone? Sir, that is often and the line that you are seeing, the, the white line, yes, the lucent line. These are the loser. Some area are like this, and these are the loser zone, which are the features of. There and there are huge fractures. So this is suggesting that it's not just a disease. Uh, this is localized to the growth plate. It is a generalized bone effect. And what it looks like is more of a uh, a generalized demineralization in that perspective. So this is what you need to then start considering in that regards. Do we have features of hyperparathyroid bone disease? In no, sir. You could have magnified. Do we have any features of uh, periosteal resorption? Not much of features. Not. So, what it means is that it is, if you look at this x ray, it is predominantly a problem of the mineral. If there is a problem predominantly of uh, vitamin D, you will have just the distal involvement yes. much more. The bones will not be there. If you have problem, problem of hyperparathyroidism, pseudo hyperparathyroidism, secondary hyperparathyroidism, primary hyperparathyroidism, you will have patchy areas from which the bone is taken out and you will have some resorption and risk will happen in that regard. If you have acidosis, now acidosis can also impair mineralization. Again, similar picture, but if you have complete deficiency, then also you can have a similar picture. So we also got the investigation, basic calcium, phosphorus and ALP profile was done, which showed a low normal level of calcium with significantly low phosphorus. And this, uh, the previous report was even more severe with the phosphorus level of 1.06 milligram per deciliter. And the alkyl phosphorus levels were very high, which is suggesting that the bone is uh, working so much to produce uh, the minerals and uh, to rule out the phosphorus. So if you look at these reports, calcium low, phosphorus low, ALP high. Sign differential here. So one is uh, so one is the proximal artery. Second will be hypophosphatemic rickets that may occur. I was saying that hypophosphatemic rickets is excluded. So by the level of phosphorus, it is excluded. No, by the level of calcium. So it is excluded because it is calcium. So hypophosphatemic rickets cannot happen in this sort of picture. That's what I'm trying to say. Other calcioplenic every form you can have. So, how often will you have hypocalcemia and hypophysic? This is borderline. Okay, so but even borderline should not happen in that regard. So, hypocalcemia excludes hypophysic. That is one. So, this then you can think of VDDR, minor form, you can say theoretically. You can say malabsorption also, this picture will happen. You can say this picture can happen in RTA, which is very, very characteristic of this picture. Now, Naveen, based upon your this report, is it more likely to be a proximal or a distal artery? If I think it's RTA. Sir, it is more likely to be a proximal because of the, it is very much clear that the alkaline phosphate is very extremely elevated, which is seen more because of hypophosphatemia occurring in proximal rather than the acidosis causing uh, uh, bony deformities. That's what Manoj has mentioned that in distal artery, the problem is because of acidosis and decreased bone formation or bone elution. If you put the bone in the acid, it is being taken out. So there, there is no increased turnover if the formation is there. So ALP is usually normal. It is not low. But if your ALP is high and you're thinking of RTA, this is a strong suggestion that this will be proximal Proximate. than this. So this is a subtle sign. What about calcium between proximal and distal? Sir, uh, it is almost covering both. You said there will be calcium so loss. You will not have very severe hypocalcemia, but mild, which is good enough to cause hyperparathyroidism. See, ideally, I would expect both of them to have some hyperparathyroidism, which will further contribute to the bony deformity. Now, you said phosphorus level of 1. 
Because what does it uh, say? Well, proximal or distal? Proximal. Because proximal, you are mainly losing phosphorus. So if you have a phosphorus of 2.5, both of them can have that. But if you have a documented 1, 1 1.5, it is more likely to be a distal argument. Okay, carry forward. And to rule out the other possibility, which you already mentioned, is the uh, chronic liver disease with the SGPT was in the normal range. And uh, malabsorption of celiac disease was ruled out. And uh, <clears throat> to rule out the possibility of uh, uh, vitamin E deficiency, which is extremely rare because he has taken tons and tons of injections, which was found to be on the normal range. And we got the venous blood gas analysis done, which was suggestive of uh, mild acidosis with bicarbonate at the level of 16 with a uh, base excess of minus 9.1. And uh, it was a case of a normal anionic gap metabolic acidosis. So now in this case, you haven't done a TMP GFR. How do you know that the phosphorus is being lost in urine primarily? The sir, phosphorus is low. How yes, do you know it is the urinary loss of phosphorus? Sir, because of the fact that there is a uh, normal anionic gap metabolic acidosis. Based upon those three. You haven't got a TMP GFR done yes, sir. or a TRP done. So do you think you are justified to say that the phosphorus is lost because of urine? Because dietary phosphorus deficiency is extreme error, which is not. Anybody whose phosphorus is low has to be because of renal phosphorus deficiency. If you look at the formula of the MPGFR, it starts by plasma phosphate minus the ratio. So anybody whose plasma phosphate is low, his TMPGFR has to be. So what I'm trying to say is that it is a very tedious investigation and it is not going to make a huge difference in terms of evaluation and management. So low phosphorus. Chronic hypophosphatemia is equivalent to renal loss of phosphorus. You will not have chronic hypophosphatemia without high PPH. This is very clear. As I said, chronic hyponatremia is because of high AV. AVP. Chronic hypokalemia is because of high aldosterone. Same, if you have chronic hypophosphatemia, it is because of high PPH or a primary tubular in which you are losing. So that is very, very clear. Don't worry in that regard. So now this picture in a refractory rated scenario, mild hypocalcemia, low phosphorus and a high AMP goes more in favor of a proximal RT if you excluded chronic kidney disease and severe disease, the other two definitions. Now we'll go on to the acidosis. So how do you interpret this blood gas? So because bicarbonate is on the lower side with the base axis, which is more than minus five suggestive of mild to moderate um, metabolic acidosis with normal anion gap. So could this be because of secondary hyperparathyroidism, uh, Pratik? If we say there is vitamin D deficiency, now you have corrected. And because of that, we had hyperparathyroidism, which caused fentanyl like picture. And you had mild metabolic acidosis, phosphorus. So, but in the case, do you think no, this case? No, no. Because there are fractures. Theoretically, you had presented a case like this who had recent onset vitamin deficiency, secondary hyperparathyroidism, and mild metabolic acidosis. So, this is a similar picture. Here also, you don't have very huge metabolic acidosis, but you uh, clearly can't cause fracture. So, which means that there is this metabolic acidosis is also not causing fracture. This is part of the illness. The main problem is somewhere else. That somewhere else looks like possible. Because if acidosis was the main problem, AFP should be low or normal. And phosphorus, anyway, doesn't make a difference. So now, this is a mild acidosis. So now, do you think this is proximal or distal? Sir, now it is almost conclusive that it is more likely to go in favor of proximal because of the fact that the acidosis is self-limiting in proximal. So in this case, it is mild. Apart from that, there is severe hypophosphatemia with raised levels of ALP. All this more, uh, more now, going towards very, very clearly a child who has a very early onset, relatively early onset of bone deformity with fractures, very high ALP importantly, very low phosphorus which is documented and mild metabolic acidosis. I think there is not much doubt that this is proximal RT. So your aim should be that by the time you reach to more complicated investigation, your diagnosis is made. Let's go forward for you. And we also got the PTH done, which was normal. So this also rules rule out the possibility of distal RTA with secondary hyperparathyroidism causing this kind of picture. And the sodium and potassium are then, potassium was found to be on the low normal side. 
and we have this patient with high, uh, acidosis with hypophosphatemia and all the previous investigation which clearly suggested of uh, proximal rta but when we got the these investigation done it added slightly it gave us a more confusing picture with the urine ph uh, falling above 6.5.5 .5, which is uh, 6.4 and the rest of the which was suggestive of a proximal tubular dysfunction in the form of glycosuria of 2 plus albinuria was present which is 1 plus and there was hypercalciuria which is suggested by high urinary spot calcium creatinine ratio and the uh, sonography kb was done to rule out nephrocalcinosis and it was not there. What does high urinary calcium creatinine ratio suggest, Manoj? Very high. Proximal versus distal? You have hypercalciuria. What is the So, more likely for proximal or distal? Hypercalciuria can occur in both. And despite the hypercalciuria, there is no nephrocalcium. What is it? Proximal. It is something like uh, when you say reducing substance positive, but it is non glucose reducing substance. Then you say it is glycosuria. So, hypercalciuria can happen in both proximal and distal RTA. But despite hypercalciuria, an eight year old child not having a nephrocalcinosis or even a stone, it is extremely unlikely to be a distal RTA. So, this was in favor of a proximal RTA. What saves these patients from developing nephrocalcinosis? So, they have citrate urea and alkaline. Uh, in that sense, they don't have a problem. With that. So, I think this was a very, very interesting case. We will now have some theoretical discussion before we go further about this case in terms of etiology and in terms of uh, evaluation. So, we all know that renal acid base regulation involves the excretion of proton. Everyday body produces 1 to 2 millimoles per kg of proton, which is excreted and then it is reabsorbed and then secreted basically. While bicarb is filtered at a huge amount, that's like 70 millimoles per liter. So if somebody is losing bicarb, competing that will be much more difficult as compared to have treating somebody who is just having a problem in acid excretion. In other words, distal RTA will have much more severe acidosis. We'll talk about that later. But treating distal RTA will be easier as compared to treating proximal RTA because whatever bicarb you give, is going to be lost in the urine. That's a primary mechanism. Now, 99% is absorbed. Only 1% is lost in that regards. So, as discussed, most of the bicarb is actually reabsorbed at the level of the proximal tubule along the soda bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate, and carbonic anhydrase enzyme. Along with that, you have absorption of phosphorus, amino acids, and glucose. So, if you have a generalized proximal tubular dysfunction, you will have amino acid urea, phosphate urea, glucose urea, which will be a very easy clue. So always look at the urine routine. Often we order that and we don't see it. Here, it was there. The treating physician doctor had already discussed and found there was a glucose urea. That could be a very, very strong pointer that there is something wrong in that perspective. Now, out of this, then the bicarb is basically 10% resorbed at the distal tubule. Now, within this perspective, we are talking about RTA. It can be because of two things. Either you are not able to excrete the acid or you are not able to absorb the bicarb. So, the problem could be proximal RTA in which you have a major problem out here. So, in this scenario, once your bicarbonate level goes below 15, the amount of bicarb filtered will be less. So, then you will be able to acidify your urine and that is why it's a self-limiting disease. Typical bicarb levels in proximal RTA are 12 to 20. In my experience, usually it's around 16, 15, 16, something like that is the usual fellow. Once the blood becomes acidic, the urine also becomes acidic. So this is very, very important. If your pH is less than 7.2, your urinary pH as a normal response should be less than 5.3. Rarely 5.5 is also used as a cutoff. So if you have a urinary pH above 5.3 or 5.5 with a significant acidosis, that is, that is distal RTA or what else? What other condition cause acidosis and a high urinary pH? Acidosis and high One is distal RTA. Second? So, 
So if you have a UTI because of a urease producing infection, your urinary pH may be falsely high. Second, yes. So if you have hypovolemia, you again will have alkalosis. So, so whenever you are doing a urinary pH, two things you have to do, urine routine microscopy and a urinary sodium. RM should be normal and urinary sodium should be more than 20, 25. That would basically mean that you are fine in that perspective. You don't have a dehydration in that regards. Now, this brings us to a big question. Can we have a high urinary pH in proximal artery? So high, urinary pH high means more than 5.3, 5.5. 5. 5. So, if it's possible, if the blood pH is not, if the blood is not acidic. So, that is the most important thing. So, as we say in diabetes insipidus, that your serum sodium should be more than 145 before you start thinking and looking at what your urinary osmolality is. You, your urinary osmolality may be low if your serum sodium is 138. But the question is whether the urinary osmolality remains low when the sodium becomes above 146. Same here. You may have mild acidosis. Your pH is more than 7.2. Bicarb is not that low. The body doesn't want to be acidic. So that is why you will not have an acidic urine. So just because you have one or two urinary pHs which are more than 6, 6.37, you can't exclude the scenario of proximal RTA in that scenario. That's a big message which still comes out of this case again. Of course, there will be no calcification because you are losing calcium, but you are not having any lack of citrate. Citrate prevents you. What causes hypercalciuria in uh, RTA, let's say in general? Uh, increased sodium, increased sodium pH, you can the oil from the, uh, yes. So what you're trying to say is that your sodium delivery is more in the distal tubule and in exchange to that, you have loss of potassium, your loss of proton, your loss of calcium, all those things is there. So that is one mechanism, but that's not a primary mechanism. Why? Because in distal artery, you have some dehydration. So your sodium delivery may not be very high. When you treat then your sodium delivery will go up. So what is the other mechanism? What will happen if you have acidosis, if you have hypokalemia, what will happen? Uh, there is a polyurea. So potassium will basically be low. So body will like to uh, so save uh, potassium. No, no. Body will like to save the potassium. If you are saving potassium, then other ions have to go out. Because sodium is exchanged with proton, potassium, calcium, magnesium. So if you are having a systemic hypokalemia or a systemic acidosis, in that case, of course, you will have hypercalciuria also. Intracellular acidosis also causes hypercalciuria. That is the basic mechanism. So it's a response to acidosis. It's not a problem of distal tubule in that perspective. Now, distal RTA is a severe problem. The problem here is that... Uh, you are not able to excrete protons. If you can't excrete protons, they will keep on accumulating. So that's why it's more severe. You will have alkaline urine and there will be calcification. This is simple dichotomous variation, but as said, exceptions and confusion will happen in that regards. We'll not talk about type 4 RTA, which is more of an aldosterone problem in that regard than hyperkalemic form. So RTA could be distal because of genetic defects, acquired defects, alkaline urine, severe form, may be isolated with calcification. One very common association of distal RTA is deafness. So whenever you have a child with rickets, always ask about deafness as an important parameter. Proximal, which can be genetic or part of acquired drugs, and it is acidic urine, self-limiting in that perspective. There will be no calcification. And then finally, we have hyperkalemic, which is rare and mild in that perspective. So if we talk about proximal RTA and we discuss this in much more detail in our last discussion about how the kidneys actually have bicarbonate resorption in the proximal tubule. So you can go into our last grand round on uh, RTA. You will find this in much more detail. It essentially involves three major players. You have got this sodium proton exchanger, proton ATPase, sodium potassium ATPase and this sodium bicarbonate channel. So the defects can be at the proton ATPase channel, which causes transient proximal RTA, sodium bicarbonate transporter, which causes recessive form, sodium proton exchanger, which causes dominant form. So there are various channelopathies which can cause this. 
or if you have a diffuse dysfunction, you will have a Fanconi syndrome. Now, we have discussed in much detail showing that there is an electrochemical gradient between the blood circulation and the lumen. So, which is negative and which is positive? This electrochemical gradient is responsible for what? Sir, it is, uh, it is responsible for positive ion absorption. So, that positive ion will include calcium, magnesium and other things. Now, because of this problem, if that gradient is disrupted, all your calcium loss will also happen in that regard. So, that becomes important from that perspective. So, now we have discussed about what is proximal, what is distal RTA. Now, Naveen will talk further about how do we talk about more causes of RTA. Sir, nicely summarized regarding the various causes of both distal as well as proximal RTA. Now, I'll be discussing the various causes with relation to this particular case. And uh, we have this case of uh, Fanconi syndrome. And with regards to the cause, it can be a case of uh, isolated Fanconi syndrome where there is only sole manifestation of proximal uh, renal tubular dysfunction, which could be either hereditary in the form of uh, Fanconi renal tubular syndrome 1, 2, 3, 4, where the uh, gene affected is the FRTS gene. And in most of the cases, it can be sporadic. And with regards to the other manifestation, which are generally seen in association with the proximal renal tubular acidosis includes the cystinosis, dent disease, low syndrome, trisensima type 1, galactosemia, hereditary factors intolerance, Fanconi Bickel syndrome, Wilson disease, and mitochondrial body. Here we'll be discussing the three major diseases where the proximal renal tubular acidosis is the cardinal manifestation of the syndrome, and the other uh, features are also present. And we'll be leaving out the uh, other syndromes where uh, one of the association of the syndrome is proximal renal tubular acidosis. And um, the three which are actually mentioned includes the cystinosis, den disease and the low syndrome. The other disease where the proximal renal tuberculosis is very common is the Vancani Bickel syndrome, which is associated with hepatomegaly and uh, proximal renal tubular uh, dysfunction, but it usually presents at a very younger age, uh, which is around uh, less than in the infantile group. So we will be dealing with the uh, three diseases in detail. What is the pathophysiology of Vancani Bickel? So the group so basically, it also causes hypoxia. It's a definition of PSD zero. So, with regards to cystinosis, it is basically autosomal recessive disease, which is characterized by mutation in the CTNS gene. CTNS gene is responsible for the production of a protein called the cystinosin. Cystinosis is basically a transporter which actually uh, extrudes uh, cysteine amino acid from the lysosomes. In case of this defective protein synthesis. Uh, this system starts accumula accumulating within the lysosomes and uh, causes destruction of the cells. So this is more commonly distributed in the proximal renal tubules and also in the eye. And apart from that, it is also seen in multiple systems and the core manifestations are the proximal renal tubular acidosis with a uh, ocular manifestation. And uh, there are basically three different types or the groups of uh, cystinosis. The first one is the most severe form, which is the infantile form, where there is development of uh, proximal renal tubular acidosis occurring within the first month of life, and uh, which is followed by ocular manifestation in the form of uh, cysteine crystals getting deposited in the cornea, leading to various forms of keratopathy and other, uh, other various ocular manifestation. And the next most important uh, organ <coughs> or uh, the system which is commonly affected with respect to cystinosis is the endocrine system, which is characterized by uh, insulin requiring diabetes uh, mellitus, and there is uh, features of hypogonadism, delayed puberty, azospermia, and there is growth hormone deficiency, which are seen associated with cystinosis. And multi-organ, many organs are actually involved with respect to cystinosis. And the prognosis is very grave because the many of the uh, children, if uh, unrecognized, usually land up in CKD within the first decade of life. So it is very important to consider uh, cystinosis as a possible diagnosis when you are seeing a patient with a proximal renal acidosis in the infantile group because uh, of the management option which is available with cystinosis. And the next uh, form which is extremely rare, which is seen in about 5% of the cases of cystinosis is a juvenile form, which is basically a slow progressive form of the cystinosis where the patients are usually often diagnosed in the uh, after the uh, first decade of life, most commonly in the adult age with uh, end-stage renal disease. And uh, this, uh, if you could uh, actually correlate with the case, this probably can be a case of juvenile form of uh, cystinosis where we actually diagnose it at a pretty early period with the proximal renal tubular dysfunction. 
and uh, the which uh, there is one more form which is the rare form where there is only ocular manifestation in the absence of renal manifestations so most important which part which i mentioned is the recognition of the disease because of the fact that treatment is available which is available in the form of histamine bitartrate which is known to uh, slow the progression of disease and uh, it has shown to improve growth delay the progression of end stage renal failure but it has not shown to cause improvement in the symptoms of proximal renal tubular function and also ocular manifestations but uh, when when this uh, system is given the form of ocular drops then it has shown to uh, uh, decrease the uh, cystine crystals which are being formed in the pointers of cystine so clinical pointers is basically the proximal renal tubular dysfunction along with the uh, night blind theory photophobia is more common sir photophobia and is the manifest so we need to do a slit lamp examination to look for the crystals sir. and uh, and with uh, and with regards to proximal renal tubulosis it is basically the supportive therapy which i'll be discussing in the next few slides and uh, in case if the uh, end stage renal disease has manifested then we need to go in for renal transplantation and the next most important but it doesn't uh, correlate with the case is is the low syndrome which is caused which is excelling uh, recessive form of disease uh, characterized by mutation in the ocrl1 gene which basically represents the ocular cerebral renal syndrome which has manifestation in the eye characterized by the presence of dense congenital bilateral cataract these cataracts can be even seen on a prenatal usg which can be diagnosed prior to the birth of the child and it is usually present at birth in the form of bilateral cataracts and they also have other manifestation in the form of glaucoma with blue plasma usually develop in the first decade first year of life and in some patients it can develop as late as around second to third decade and there is also features of corneal scarring and keloids without any history of trauma which usually occurs after 5 years of life and the next most important system to be involved is the nervous system which is characterized by severe muscular hypotonia Uh, which is usually seen during the infancy period with severe form of intellectual disability and behavior abnormalities in the form of uh, temper tantrum aggressive behavior and uh, with respect to the renal manifestation it is characterized by uh, proximal renal tubular dysfunction the form of low molecular weight proteinuria amino acid uria lysosomal enzyme uria uh, acidosis phosphaturia hypercalcinuria hypercalcemia and nephrocalcinosis and the most important thing is that uh, there is absence of glycosuria it is extremely very rare with respect to the low syndrome and uh, the patient usually develop uh, end stage uh, renal disease requiring renal transplantation and dialysis in the third and fourth, between third and fourth decade of life and other manifestations uh, are the osteopenia tenso tenoitis arthropathy growth failure dental manifestations platelet dysfunction in the form of uh, uh delay in platelet addition and uh, epidermal cyst and with regards to the another common disease which we need to identify in a case of uh, proximal renal tubular dysfunction is the dense disease and this is uh, basically excelling recessive disease which is uh, characterized by the mutation in the ccrl5 gene and uh, it is diagnosed on the basis of the criteria three criteria which is the low molecular weight proteinuria along with hypercalciuria and any one of the following which could be nephrocalcinosis nephrolithiasis hematuria hypophosphatemia and renal insufficiency so this actually goes uh, very close to our diagnosis because we already have two features and being a pr proximal renal tubular acidosis we definitely are going to have a low molecular weight proteinuria but the one thing which is actually going against is the glycosuria which is actually very Uh, rare in this case but when i saw a few number of case series and one which was basically published uh, from aims new lady they also had around 10 to 20 patients of uh, patients with dense disease had glycosuria and but various case studies show that the glycosuria is often very rare with respect to dense disease and one more thing it is most commonly seen in boys and this also being a boy child with filling the almost all the three criteria this was one of the strong possibility to be considered in this patient one factor here probably that because of renal calcification not being there yes sir, yes, sir. and uh, when you have a female carriers because this is being an excellent this is a uh, female carriers you usually have hypercalcemia low molecular weight proteinuria and uh, They're in very rare situation. They may have nephrocalcinosis, and there are like one hundred patient progressing to CKD. And this was one of the patients which I asked for the history of uh, polyuria and uh, nephrocalcinosis in mother. And with regards to the management, it is basically 
increasing the uh, uh, fluid intake along with the low sodium diet. And uh, in case there is nephrocalcinosis, which is commonly associated with this condition, we can start uh, thinking of giving diuretic, but we have to keep a control on the serum potassium level. In case if there is hypokalemia, then we can think of adding amyloride. And uh, we also have to be very cautious uh, in using vitamin D because of the fact that there's already hypercalcemia. In giving vitamin D, there's can this can lead to the development of nephrocalcinosis and nephrolytic. So we have to be quite cautious uh, when we are giving vitamin D therapy and it has to be indicated only in case of a bone disease or else it is better to avoid vitamin D therapy in this case. And in case of uh, hypophosphatemia, which is also one of the rare manifestations, which is also seen one third of the patients with dent disease, we need to supplement with phosphorus. And there's another type, which is basically dense disease too. And this is actually a continuum of the low syndrome. Low syndrome and density fall into a mutation of the involving the same gene, which is the OCR gene, but it has all the features of dense disease along with mild features of the low syndrome, which is basically characterized by mild intellectual disability, hypotonia, subclinical cataract, and nephrosin calcinosis seen around 40% of the patient. And uh, we have, when we get a mutation, with regards to the OCR gene, we have to consider whether it is low or whether it is, is a dense disease type 2. This is basically based on the uh, severe or the extra renal manifestation. In case if it is mild, it, then it is a case of dense disease type 2. In case if it is severe, then it is a case of low syndrome. So now in this case, once it is negative, so proximal what further workup would you suggest? Sir, further workup, I, I would like to have a eye examination to look for the presence of any cataract or any uh, coronary system crystals. Then I would like to go in, sir, in case it was better going for a genetic analysis so that uh, we actually- look at urinary microalbumin as a plus minus. Yes, sir, but yeah. since it is fan cone already there is glycosuria, so definitely the eye, eye examination, liver examination, these will be very, very, very important good. for that. And then genetic testing probably just to confirm the long term. Yeah. Also, outcome because treatment may be variable in certain conditions. So we will just summarize a bit about RTA. And uh, the key issue is when do we suspect RTA? We all have discussed this. If you have a growth failure, which is nutritional pattern growth failure, rickets with low phosphorus, renal calcification, periodic paralysis, polyuria, acidotic breathing, these are features of RTA. Now, when we diagnose RTA, you need to have three things. You need to have renal tubular acidosis. So you need to have a pH which has to be low, less than 7.2 ideally. Base excess has to be negative, less than minus 5. And it has to be tubular in the sense that anion gap is normal. So high anion gap situations are ruled out. Normal glomerular function and ammonium excretion is also something which we look at using urinary anion gap. So hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis with a positive urinary anion gap is equal to renal tubular acidosis. We all know about anion gap. It is the difference between the unmeasured negative ion and the unmeasured positive ion. In other words, it is the difference between measured positive ion subtracted by the measured negative ion. So it's sodium minus chloride minus bicarb. It is usually 10 to 12. If you have accumulation of organic acids, you will have a high anion gap situation. While if you have loss of bicarb or increase in HCl like GI loss <coughs> or a RTA, you will have a normal anion gap scenario. So we are talking about a normal anion gap situation. Urinary anion gap is a similar thing. It is basically the difference of urinary sodium and potassium, which are the measured positive ion from chloride. If your urinary anion gap is positive, it means ammonium production is defective. It is more like a RTA. If urinary anion gap is negative, it suggests a increased ammonium production, a normal ammonium production, and suggests a GI loss, which of course, in somebody who is 80 years old with fractures, you will not think GI loss as a primary cause here. But anyway, to evaluate, diarrhea causes increased ammonium production, and you will have a negative anion gap. And RTA, your impaired ammonium production, you will have a positive urinary anion gap in that scenario. Now, this is important and we are mainly discussing what urinary pH in this case. So, as anybody who has metabolic acidosis should have a acidic urine that is less than 5.3. If you have a pH more than 5.3, you think of distal RTA, but there are other caveats which we discussed earlier. 
Infection because of urease producing bacteria which cause high ammonia, which may cause alkaline urine. Dehydration will also cause a impaired acidification in that scenario. So basically, you need to have a urinary sodium, which is normal, and you need to have a normal urine routine microscopy before you do a urinary pH. Now, this is one test which we can do later on to confirm. This is fraction excretion of bicarb. Urinary pH is done when you have acidosis. Fraction excretion of bicarb is done when your bicarb is around 20. So once you reach that level, you can then do that. Either do a bicarb loading or even with oral, the levels go up and then you can do the test. This is basically only to look at whether your bicarb excretion is more or not. So if you do bicarb of 16, you are pretty much having a compromised one because it's already going to be less because it's not being filtered. So measures are urine and blood bicarbonate and urine and blood creatinine. The standard formula is urine bicarb upon plasma and upon uh, urinary creatinine into plasma creatinine upon plasma bicarb into 100 as we do for fraction excretion of sodium, potassium. Same thing. If the level is more than, usually it's 15 to 20 percent in proximal RTA and less than 3 percent, 2 percent in distal RTA. So it's a good test but should only be done when your serum bicarb is more than 20. The problem is how will you get serum bicarb of 20 in proximal RTA because as soon as you start doing that, you will lose bicarb. So I would say even if your bicarb is 18 and your Fe bicarb is high, then it is basically a proximal RTA. You don't, don't need to wait till 20. The only issue is that at 18, if your Fe bicarb is low, you cannot exclude proximal RTA. To exclude proximal RTA, this cutoff of 20 is there. Urine to blood CO2 difference provides the evidence about how much your urine is acidifying. Requisite, again, you need to be doing this in metabolic acidosis. You look at urine and blood CO2. And in that scenario, if it's low, it is distal. If it is high or normal, it is proximal. Now, how do you measure urine CO2? Sam. How do you collect the urine sample for a blood gas measurement? So if you collect simply and it gets exposed to the air, your oxygen will be more, carbon dioxide will be less. So what you can do? You can put a oil and on that collect. So oil becomes up and then you put a, either a capillary or a syringe and then you try to pull it off. So urine sample should be taken with a drop of oil when you're collecting that. That will give you a more reliable finding in that scenario. So now if we summarize, you have a bicarb which is on the high normal side, 12 to 20, not very low. Your potassium is low. Urinary pH is less than 5.3. And urinary calcium is normal to high. It is usually proximal RTA. Distal RTA, the bicarb would be much lower. Hypokalemia will be much more profound. Urinary pH would be more than 5.3 and hypercalciuria will also be more. But hypercalciuria again is not a discriminatory test. Fe bicarb will be much lower in distal RTA. So the most important test here I would say is urinary pH and Fe bicarb. Urinary 